I think we're ready to get started, guys. Thanks for coming. This is the first seminar of the GSL 27, mm -hmm. if I counted my X's and V's right. Uh, thanks for coming. This is just the, uh, the basic craftsmanship um, seminar. If anybody, so Vince has a, some, a couple of handouts. If you didn't get one, they'll be happy to give you one. So we're going to kind of introduce each other since um, we're kind of co-teaching this. Uh, my name is Chad Smith. I'm kind of calling myself the new guy because I feel like I am. Um, I just met Vince uh, today. This is my first GSL competition I've ever participated in. My second competition ever in my life. Um, I, of course, like most people, I started when I was younger. Took a break after high school for a really long time. Was doing model railroading. Uh, got back into automotive scale modeling about four years ago and have been kind of uh, just doing cars exclusively since then. Ran into um, Paul Brinkhurst and the Sheila Lyons at the model store. They convinced me that I needed to expand my horizons uh, and join the club and start competing, which I did. Um, and then I met Mark Gustafson and he asked me if I would present today. So here I am. Um, and of course, I'm co-teaching with Vince today, and I'll let you, him introduce himself. How's everybody doing? I know right. almost all of you guys have been coming to GSL since 2005, after Greg told us we had to come out, and then we haven't missed one since. So it's been fun. So today I met Chad for the first time, and uh, Mark had asked me the same thing. He said, hey, uh, there's a new guy. His name is Chad. He's a really, really clean builder. He said, I'd like you guys to do a basic craftsmanship seminar. So we both said, okay, we agreed. Not sure if we're going to have a whole lot to tell you guys, but you never know. <laughs> so that's kind of my concern uh, doing this seminar. How many people here have been modeling less than a year? Right, so nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I created this PowerPoint a while ago when I was kind of teaching at um, MRS Hobbies and uh, some other local things. This is geared for the absolute beginner. So I'm gonna breeze over a lot of this stuff because you guys know a lot of this stuff. So Vince and I discussed, we're probably gonna do this seminar as more of an open format. So as we go through, if there's something that catches your attention or you have a question on, uh, go ahead and get our attention, raise your hand, and we'll, we'll kind of run the, the seminar a little less formally, a little more like that kind of a question and answer, since most of you are advanced builders, probably more advanced than I am. If you, when you do get questions, would you just repeat them back? Yep, we'll repeat them back, yep, perfect. Since we have the mic, we won't be able to hear on the video. Okay, so uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, one of the things that I probably most stress is have a dedicated area and work surface. Um, my model, my, my projects have been described as very clean and I think that's, from the beginning, everything that I do is clean. I don't have a lot of clutter, a lot of glue sitting around. Um, of course, hobby mats, things like that, you can get at hobby stores. Those are really important. Uh, this is my workstation that I've kind of been progressively building up um, I just recently added uh, a lot of these little hobby organizer drawers. These things are amazing. Um, I can't remember the brand now, but uh, anyway, those things are really good. Have a, have a dedicated, clean work area um, to keep your stuff clean as you build. Anything you add on that? Uh, I feel the same way. I've got on the handout that I made, People always ask me these same questions usually every time I go to a show. They'll say, you know, your models look so clean, they sit so right, your wiring looks right, uh, you don't see any traces of glue anywhere. And the same as Chad, I try to keep everything clean. I keep my hands clean all the time, always concentrating on where my stuff is, on my bench, where's my glue. I do a lot of little extra detail parts and I put my super glue usually on a little piece of plastic, a little puddle, and then I apply the glue from that puddle to where I'm gonna attach the part. I'm always conscious about where's that little piece of plastic with the glue on it. It's okay if it gets stuck to your sleeve or something, but right? I mean, 
done that. You don't want it to get stuck on, oh, geez, I put the hood down upside down and now it's on that. Um, I'm always cleaning my hands. I have a little thing of water that I keep on my bench. Anytime I'm gonna pick up a part that's almost all near completion, I dip my hands in water just a little bit. I wipe it on my shirt, whatever, have a rag, just anything to make sure that I don't transfer any <coughs> blood or dirt or glue or paint onto my finished piece. So I get that a lot from guys who go to shows and guys at our club. They always say, God, your models look like you didn't touch them. Like, well, you try not to, as little as possible. Yeah. Treat it like it's a museum piece from the beginning. Um, Question. Go ahead. Do you used to use white plastic gloves? Do you still do that? I do sometimes. Oh, Greg, Question. John asked about using gloves. And a lot of times I do on final assembly when I put my windows in. Yeah, a lot of times these guys ask me, how do I keep my glass so clean? And I always polish the glass, get it all nice and ready, and then I polish it after it's installed from the inside. And then I, you know, I hold it from the outside, polish the inside, hold the inside, polish the outside with gloves, and then hopefully I don't have to touch the inside of the glass anymore after it's finally installed. And the gloves keep, even something that you can scratch in with the, you know, you've got a rough spot on your finger, you scratch the glass again. So I still do that. So the cotton gloves, I've seen those around. Um, I use just these rubber gloves. I get boxes of these at Costco, Sam's, whatever. Um, and I almost always have this on my hand when I'm working, even from the beginning. Because uh, a couple of times I've done a model and then I paint it. And of course we all know what fish eyes are. So this always goes on my, I'm right-handed, so it goes on my left hand because my left hand is my working hand or my holding hand, so I hold everything with my gloved hand and work with my, with my, uh, with my right hand. So, yeah, even from the beginning, when I'm cleaning my parts, everything, I always have a glove on my hand, so that kind of keeps the fingerprints and, and everything to a minimum. Any other questions? Perfect. What's next? I don't know, what do you got next idea? Uh, well, let's see. Tools. Uh, you guys all know what this is, right? I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. These are just some of the basic tools that... Wait. Go ahead. Back up. Back up? Sprue cutting tool. Ah. Uh, you, you should go like, yay, on the sprue cutting tool. <laughs> sprue cutting tool. Yes, that. Sprue cutting tool. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute, because that is a, an important part of a clean build. Um, I used to use my hobby knife well, I remember being a beginner and he would just, you know, <laughs> snap, right? Yeah. And then I'm missing a piece of my part that I, I needed. Um, cutting it with my hobby knife, and then I graduated to nippers. And then, you can see my, my caffeine is, is kicking in, right? And then I upgraded to actual side cutters, and these are specific, these are Tamiya side cutters. These things are, either one of these are indispensable when taking things off of the sprue trees. Um, absolutely for, for keeping, keeping parts clean. And then I use my, my X-Acto knife to scrape and clean the parts after I get them off of the sprue. Uh, sanding, tape, brushes, different types of glue, paint. Um, carefully remove the parts. Of course, look for flashing. Uh, we all know what flashing is. That's terrible stuff. Clean that off as, as best you can. Uh, and then the screw cutters. And then, of course, getting the parts uh, scraped and sanded smooth, ready for paint and primer. Um, anything I'm joking on? That? I do the same. OK. Obviously, when I'm putting parts together, there's going to be seams, right? Almost always on the engine block, on the seats, Front and back, they come in multiple pieces. Um, I've just glued this one together and then run a uh, Sharpie marker across it to see uh, where my lines are that I need to sand down to. And of course, when the black line is gone, everything looks nice and smooth. That's, the, that's what I'm looking for, that's the goal, is to eliminate all those mold lines. Um, again, on the engine block, very common. Transmission, the oil pan. Uh, get those sanded down nice and smooth. Sometimes you'll need to add filler. If you do, add filler. Um, and that you can see I've added a little bit of filler in there, and that I think is just, if I remember right on that one, I just used to me a primer. 
I just filled in the filled in the gap. Question. Uh, well, not a question, but a lot of transmissions actually have a seam running down the middle of it because it's a cast part. Okay. So the machine. so the statement is the uh, a lot of times the transmission will have a, a weld seam down the middle. That is correct. So if that's the look you're going for, then keep it. Keep the seam on there if you want. Scrape some little mold, uh, some welding, whatever you do, add to the effect if you want. Yeah, if you want to keep the seam line perfect, keep it. Yeah, it's actually a, a molded part before they machine it, but I have seen them where they're completely polished. Okay. You know, yep. molded and completely polished for show cars. Sure, yeah, so sometimes the seam is supposed to be there, sometimes it's not. So again, depending on the look you want for. Um, I'll say this right now, in case I forget. I think the most important part of building is build what you want, build the way you want to build it. This is your hobby, this is your interest. Uh, you know, we can sit up here and blow smoke all day long. It's your hobby, you get to build the way you want to build. So this is not the right way, this is the way I do it, and if you want to take something, perfect. Um, if not, you know, I don't really care. It's your hobby, you get to build it the way you want to build it. Of course, next we're going to go into, we've got the, uh, the branding marks of just put Sharpie on there to highlight that a little bit. Um, again, it's your build. You can build it how you want. If you want to know what kind of car it is, you know, we turn, I forgot what that is. Oh, it's a 1969 <laughs> Camaro under license. Okay, perfect. Now I know. Oh, you do with it? Question. Okay, so the statement is, um, have an idea of what you want to build before you build it. And that's absolutely correct. I mean, if you get halfway through and you have no idea what your end goal is, you're just kind of putting stuff together, it'll probably look like that when you're done. Putting stuff together, not really a, a goal in mind. So yeah, if you, if you know from the beginning, you've done your research, well, my transmission has a weld line down the middle, maybe I'll keep that seam. Um, again, it's, it's your build. Do your research beforehand and know what you know, kind of your end goal. Um, yep. And then, of course, we have uh, underneath the the uh, top there, of course, the, the mold. I like those. those. I like to keep those. Yeah. 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 Did you number them once? Then you I did. <laughs> Go ahead. What's the best way to remove those from the inside of a roof? So you can't really get a knife. You can't. Um, I recently purchased a tool from Tamiya. Sorry. Uh, question is, how do you get rid of the injection marks there? Um, I've done a few different things from using coarse sanding sticks, uh, which does leave sand marks in there that you have to then refill, things like that. Uh, the tool that I just found recently that is I have found works fabulously on that is a Tamiya. And it's basically a small chisel, is what it looks like. But it's designed for that. And I, of course, just purchased it like two weeks ago, so I don't know exactly what it's called. Uh, I think it's a new tool from to me, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, it just smooths those things right off. And it, it works really, really well. So that, again, a recent find of mine, I found that that actually works the best so far. And I've used roof clear files on those, the files that are bent with a curved on the end, so you can put your pressure down and slide them back and forth without trying to get a flat file in there. PA's got a question. Yeah, um, yeah thanks for that, the tip. When you mentioned Tavia, they have got a lot of really fantastic modeling tools now. One manufacturer or vendor I would suggest to everybody, if you haven't heard of it, is Hobby Link Japan. The wildest, weirdest tools scratch building materials you'll ever want to look for will be there. And what they have for this now, if they come to me, is you've got the body this way where you have a curve of the roof and they have a sander that has a crook in it and another crook. So you come in through the window and you actually are touching the flat surface without hitting any of the window molding. And somebody in Japan said, hey, that's a cool tool. Oh, that's cool. So 
Gundam or sci-fi crazy thing, and that's what they use. And you buy these things when you can and, and use them. Okay. So the suggestion for the company is Hobby, Hobby Link Japan. Hobby Link HLG. Japan. Com. Okay, and the suggestion was that they have several tools that are, are good for it. They've got a very good ordering. You can order a lot of stuff from them. You don't have to worry about will it get to you. You can order online completely safe, and they have something called a, 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 a purchase warehouse. You buy your stuff. It's in stock. You buy it, and then it goes in your private warehouse for 90 days, paid for, and then you can bolt it together in a shipment and then ship it out. Your payment, your, your insurance, your shipping package. So you don't have to worry about a little tiny part being shipped that costs you $25 to have it. You can group them in any way you want to have. But some things are always are in stock, but it's you'll be on there. I've, I've dropped a couple thousand dollars <laughs> over the last couple of years just to have the parts because when, they, when the companies like these, the little baby companies, they have a motorcycle. This stuff will take away your show. But like a motorcycle chain for a 1 8 motorcycle that was a kit to build the entire motorcycle chain link by pin by link. It's a kit, and you can build it for where you want to put your master link on there and the gears, call it a day. You're done. So a lot of valuable tools and, and when parts that goes out of and they stop making it, you ain't never seen it again. <laughs> no, that's true. Go ahead. You know, you can always use a Dremel tool with rounded burrs, bullet mm -hmm. shaped burrs carefully, and then I just use sandpaper that wet sand with my thumb, which is usually contoured. You get a curve out yeah. of it. So Dremel tools with a with a curved bit. Yeah, carefully. Any other suggestions on how to get rid of those? Make it a <laughs> <laughs> Obviously that was funny, but I didn't hear it. Make it a convertible. Oh. He meant to take them out, but he ended up just accidentally. Yeah, drilled all the way through. I've, I've done that. Body filler. John's got something to put there. Yeah, you can take dowels and loop sandpaper to the end of the dowel. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So take dowel and glue sandpaper to it. Yeah, perfect. All right. Or just leave them there. <laughs> or just leave them there. The number of them. Yeah. Again, I mean, uh, kind of being a new guy, I didn't even know that these were a problem until I met some of you guys and their competitive builders and started telling me, yeah, you need to take those off. Hmm, okay. I'll start taking them off. But before that, I just... Left them on, you know. I'm not gonna. I'm the one looking at my car. I'm not. I know they're there. I'm not gonna pick it up. And, oh, look at the roof line. There's both lines in there. All right. Of course, on the hood, we're gonna get rid of all those. So basically, we want to get everything cleaned up and ready to go before we before we even move to painting. Now, I'm sure. Again, I'm, I'm speaking to far more experienced modelers than myself, but every single part gets touched, gets filed, gets sanded before I even get to primer. So I'm into my builds, you know, 10, 20 hours at a minimum just to even, just before I get to even painting anything or priming anything, making sure it's all nice and clean. And I'm the same exact way. Everything gets cleaned and prepped and test fitted and tested it again, right? We were talking about this, Barry and I were talking about out there, right? So talking about test fitting, we'll throw this in. I know there's so many guys in our club that have said, oh, I built that same model that you just built, but mine doesn't sit like that in the front. Mine sits too high. I said, well, mine sat high too, but then I cut the spindle off or I opened up the wheel, you know, the backing plate so that it wouldn't sit lower. And then Barry and I were talking about windows. We know that all of us have been guilty of it, right? You build the model, you get everything done, you paint it, and then you go put your glass in. You gotta do that first, because how many times you put the glass in and then the interior tub doesn't fit anymore. Right? Now you're dealing with everything's painted and you're painted. So Chad and I were talking, we almost built the models first in bare plastic before, right? Make sure I put the windows in first, test fit it, then put the tub in. The dash, everything, does it all clear? I still get the chassis up in there before any paint goes on anything. And we get guys in our club that all the time, they do this over and over again. This stuff doesn't fit, they can't get the glass in, the hood doesn't shut. Right? The, the hood's too tight, they never tested it before they painted it. That to me, I don't know how you can possibly not see if the hood fits before you put primer on. Right, in fact, you'll see a couple of, actually my cars over there, um, I won't tell you which ones, <laughs> that I haven't done, I didn't do that before, I didn't test fit. I didn't test fit the hood 
Um, I didn't test fit that. And even if I did test fit it, I test fit it before I primed and painted and had the thickness to it. So as Vince said, test fit, prime it, test fit it again, paint it, test fit it again, then glue it. And I still do that. I still, well, I've tested it. I know this works. Glue right in. Uh, doesn't work. Question. What are you using for glue when you're test fitting everything? A lot of my white glue don't seem to. I, I do use a lot of the white glue. Sometimes I just use little bits of tape. I take little pieces of masking tape and I, I slice tiny little strips and I just tape the thing in place just to keep it there. Or sometimes I use that fun tack stuff. That, that little, yeah, like, like little yellow poster stick posters on the walls with. Yeah. To put a little bit of that. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be on the inside. Sometimes I'll put the part on and then put the fun tack or the white glue on the outside of it just to hold it in place, just to see, right? And then I, as soon as I know it's ready, then I take it off so that I don't forget when I've got some glue residue that I left on there and paint it over it. So that's what I use. I don't know about Chad. So your question was, what are you glue, what are you using to glue to test fit so that you can yeah. take it apart? Yeah. Oh, okay. I I don't pre glue. I've never done that. That's a good. I might try doing that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I just test fit it, um, and then if it fits, great. If I need it to stay there, I'll usually use like um, to me a tape. I use the hobby tack, and, uh, things like that. Um, well, glue. One suggestion is if you need more strength than white glue, a tape will allow you uh, micro dots of super glue. Micro dots of super glue. Oh, you mean just using a tiny, tiny drop of super glue? Yeah, that way you can pry it off later? Yeah, that's a good point. Mm. Okay. Well, I think like PA has yeah, something. He had that illustration with, it looked like he did to the home stretch where you're going to start painting the parts and you attach each one to something. Was that mm -hmm. thing? What did you use to attach those parts to those uh, the, the sticks? They looked like little wooden sticks. Yeah, uh, any questions? Any more questions about glue? I'm using. Okay, perfect. Let me go back to that. Um, so they're basically just alligator clips. Uh, most of them are alligator clips. Like this one is not. That's just hobby tack or the poster tack, blue tack. I'm sorry, blue tack. Um, if I can't get a spot on there where the alligator clip won't fit, uh, I'll use the blue tack. Otherwise, like here you can see the alligator clip, I've super glued them to the hobby sticks. I bought a bundle of these hobby sticks at Hobby Lobby. And, I mean, there's 200 in there. I mean, there's just a million of them in there. And I just glued alligator clips that I got from Home Depot to my sticks. So that way it gives me a clean holding surface. So I'm not trying to hold my part, paint it, get, smear the paint with my fingers. Um, so that's, that's how I get my parts ready for priming and painting. And I do something similar to that. Uh, some of my parts look exactly like Chad's. Also, sometimes what I'll do is what I'm gonna do, for example, a steering wheel, I might super glue a piece of round plastic to the back of the steering wheel, and that's gonna be there permanently, right? And then I stick that in the alligator clip. And then when it's all painted and done, then I just take my screw cutter and I just trim that off. And then I can work on the steering wheel or whatever that little part is without touching it, handle it, rubbing the paint off it, leave it there till the last minute, and then I cut it off even, and then glue it on. Say that again. You put super glue on the back. I I might take the steering wheel and I'll put a round piece of stock behind it. Oh. Super glue it to that. Right now, that's almost like a steering column. It's permanent. Yeah. So I can take that. I can spin it if I want to, you know, touch it, paint it, and spin it while I'm painting it. And then when I'm done, then I snip it off with the screw cutter. I like that. That's a good idea. Any other questions? Go ahead. Take some uh, number 11 exact knife blades, your old ones, tape them to your uh, your sticks you have right there. And mm -hmm. you can stick those in an inconspicuous part on your part, on the back side or something. Works oh. great. Yeah, that's true Not too. Not to hold it while you spray paint it. Walk right off. Yeah. So Gary's saying I stick it. Home, so put stick <laughs> So Gary's saying use a old blades and stick the parts in there. One in. Cool. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, he did surprise us. Oh, I did not. Oh, so glad to see you. Oh my god. How are you? We've been trying to get this guy to come out here for years. 
We just, yeah. had, we just had a couple of visitors. But it lands and it goes back down. Andy Barrett from Myers Club. Andy Barrett from Myers Club. Oh, man. Andy. Thanks, welcome. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, of course, the body is the, probably the most important part because that's the part that we're seeing the most. Uh, so, of course, we want to spend some time on our prepping our body. So, obviously, from the kit, we're going to have mold lines. Those, of course, have to come off. Um, you can use your hobby knife, scrape them off. Careful with that. Um, one of my favorite things that I've been doing with them lately, the sanding sticks are good. Um, the, to me, a sanding sponges. Uh, they give a little bit of flex so they kind of can conform to some of the fenders, things like that. Excellent. They have all kinds of grades. Yeah. To me, is they got great stuff. Once I get my mold lines off of there, I'll actually put a, a little bit of a sand on the entire body, um, probably around a 600 grit. I find that usually works pretty well. It gives some primer something to, to eat into. And then, of course, my primer. Now, once I get my primer on there, what I used to do was sand it, prime it, paint it, move on. Um, through experience and, and learning and talking with other people, I began to realize that once you prime it, if you sand that back down, you start to see your high and low points. Uh, a lot around the door jams, uh, anytime you have a mold line somewhere, seam line, of course on the, on the roof, um, you'll get little, little divots and little spots everywhere. Um, you're not going to see that until you actually sand it back down to the plastic. Once I started doing that, it was amazing um, the finish that I started coming out with by sanding it back down, keeping, if I needed to fill some stuff, I did, um, and then repriming and doing that as many times as I need to. Um, I think on one of my builds, I took it down to the plastic three times. Um, and and then uh, added stuff in there if I needed to. Go ahead. Uh, one suggestion with that uh, priming that way, uh, use two different colors of primer so right. that you can see what you're removing and what's left. The other question, now I've got a question, do you want to project on this? Yeah, so the question or the suggestion was use multiple, or use different colors of primer, and I'll get to that. You can see this one's lighter versus that one is darker. Um, so that way you can kind of see where you're standing down to. Go ahead. So now my question is, you guys have talked about cleaning and washing the body prior to getting into the paint. What do you use? Isopropyl alcohol? Do you use liquid detergent? Do you have some special <coughs> concoction? What do you do to not affect the paint in the future? I, the question is, what do you wash the bodies with to not affect the paint at the end? I myself, I just use water. I'm going to go to the kitchen sink, a little bit of running water, a little bit of dish soap, and just clean it off. That's all I use. Yeah, that's really all you need. I probably wouldn't do isopropyl alcohol. That has a tendency to really take a lot of stuff off. I mean, if that's what you want, sure. It's going to clean it, for sure. Um, but it might clean more than you want. Paul, go ahead. Chad, when you do that, that primer sand, what are you going to use? Is it hazardous? What do you use to get those high spots? Are you going to um, all different kinds. Like I have just regular sandpaper I, I cut down into squares. The question is how do I, once I get my primer, how do I sand it down? Um, if I'm on a flat surface, I want to use a flat sanding tool because um, I don't want to be grinding in, adding contours where I don't want them. If I'm on a contour, I'll use the sanding sponges um, because I can kind of curve those. Um, a lot of times also, I will actually wet sand my primer. Um, I, I find that if I use a lot of the sanding sticks, a lot of sandpaper on the primer, depending on what primer you're using, it'll actually fill your sandpaper. Uh, if you wet sand, um, just a little bowl of water, one drop of dish soap, they give it a little bit of lubricity. It actually sands it a lot. It sands it smoother, plus it, it gets rid of that uh, sanded off primer. It doesn't fill up your sandpaper, so it gives you a little bit more sanding ability. So back to the question. Um, so I use sanding squares and just use my finger as kind of my guide as far as keeping it flat and level. Um, careful with your, with your edges and corners. 
Um, so just carefully, I guess would be the answer. <laughs> but uh, sand, the sanding sponges, I, I really like those a lot. Because you can keep it flat, but you can also contour it if you need to. So those things are really great. Any particular grit that you try to just stay within? Uh, when, I'm, when I'm at my primer stage, um, it's usually probably 600. I find that's the one I'm using the most. Um, you can go a little bit higher. Prepping before I get to primer, if I need to take a lot of stuff off, I'll go down to 400 grit. Probably won't go lower than that because then you start adding deeper scratches into your plastics that are going to show up. I agree. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I got a question for you. Like, go ahead. Have you ever considered using a dye coat over the primer? Like basically, you've got your gray primer and this is like flat black. So I'm kind of what you're doing as far as fine. As a paint? No, a guide coat. A guide coat. Yes. Say, so using a guide coat. This, this Right, so a guide coat of primer or a guide coat of paint? Any primer, just something to just to put like little specks on it so when you sand it actually will show that you're low or high spots. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because sometimes people will spray paint on there. Paint is a little harder to sand, it doesn't come off as smoother. So yes, um, back to, so the question was do you ever use a guide coat? Yes, I do. Uh, that's actually a recent thing that I started doing. Um, since I'm the new guy, I'm learning all these neat little tricks and tools. Um, so yeah, in fact, you can see a little bit, uh, I can't remember if I took that down, you can see a little bit of my lighter coat coming through, because um, I had a lighter coat underneath this, then put the darker coat on top of it. So yes, guide coats, especially when you're looking for high and low spots, are a really good idea. Um, is there anybody who doesn't know what a guide coat is? Because until a couple months ago, I didn't know what a guide coat was. I wasn't sure if that was something you get at a clothing store or something. I was <laughs> Okay, perfect. What is a guide coat? Um, thank you. Now, don't feel as dumb. Uh, so a guide coat, basically, you have a light and a dark. So you can see the dark, the white is, of course, my styrene. The black or the dark gray is my primer. So the guide coat is a color variant, lighter or darker, that you put on top of your other coat. So you can see my lighter coat here. Um, the purpose of the guide coat is, from my understanding, to see how far you're sanding or to see how deep you are sanding because you don't want to sand back to the plastic. If, if you're done with that prep and you're ready for paint, you don't want to sand it back down to your plastic. So you put a guide coat on there so that you can sand when you see the color variants, you know, don't sand anymore. So it's kind of a, a guide, how, how deep am I going to sand? The other, the other thing with a guide coat, it also shows you where your sand scratches are and stuff like that. It shows you all your imperfections. <coughs> they do it a lot in the automotive field. It just saves a lot of time when you can find those scratches a lot easier. Right, so the, the question or the statement was, the, the guide coat also helps for minor imperfections, and it does. Depending on the primer, how thick the primer is, it'll actually act as a filler for you. Um, so you can see where your deep body scratches and infections are. Perfect. Yep, sounds good. How do you get your wheels straight? So a lot of times, a lot of guys have asked me how I get my wheels straight, and I get the model to sit on the table, all four wheels touching. A lot of times what I do, on the second page of the little handout that I gave, I drew a couple little diagrams. So sometimes I'll either move the hole that's where it's gotta go through, where the pin or whatever I have that's gonna be on the back of my disc brake or the drum in the back. <coughs> I will move those around if I have to. I'll move the suspension forward or backward if I have to. I sit there, when I get the models ready to do wheels and tires, and even before I start building again, when it's all in bare plastic and primer, I will sit the model on the table, I'll prop the wheels and tires up, then I'll put popsicle sticks or pieces of cardboard and I level the body off and I put the wheels and tires in there and I'll stand back. I might spend two hours on a, well, one night just making sure that the stance is right, where the wheels and tires gonna fit in the wheel well. Sometimes I'll move the wheels and tires in the wheel well, even if they're not exactly on the axle, like the last little diagram that I drew. I've got models that if you turn them upside down, the brake drum, for example, is not centered in the axle. It's not a real car, it's not gonna roll, who cares, right? 
I mean, in real life, it would go down, you know. And, but I don't care about that. I care about how does it look on the outside. How does Mark it look on the table? Yeah, Mark will care, yeah. <laughs> but I have models that, if you look really close, the axle doesn't line up with the center of the wheel. But when you look at it from the outside, the tire and wheel is in the perfect location. I spend a lot of time making sure that my tires and wheels are in the right spot. And Chad and I were talking earlier today, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll glue the driver's side wheels visually where I want them. Then I'll put the right, the passenger rear wheel on about where I want it and I make sure, now I've got three wheels that I know are perfect where I want them. Then I do the last wheel with the epoxy and I put the model on the table with the three wheels touching and then I glue that last wheel in the right spot and I wait and I look and I wait before the epoxy sets up and now it's sitting on the table and then I can move that one last tire, that tiny bit so that all four touch the ground. So maybe there's a possibility that on the driver's side and the passenger side, the wheels are not in the exact same spot, but visually it's all close enough and then all four wheels sit on the table. So I spend a lot of time with that. Right, because we've all, myself included, you know, get a model together, it looks perfect, absolutely amazing, and it's wobbling on the table, pulling your hair out and stuff, right? So again, it's your build. Do you want your tires to be able to roll and fit on the axles, or do you want your stance straight? You're gonna have to make that call on your own. It's your build. Okay, any other questions? All right, moving on. We got just a, just a few more minutes. Uh, we'll wrap it up here, and then we, we can do more question and answer after. Uh, okay, so we have got the paint on there now. Again, if I'm touching anything, I'm using my glove. Oh, back to the other thing. What do you clean your clean your car with. Um, most of the time I'll just use, especially right out of the box, uh, water with a little bit of dish soap. Works great. Works great. The other thing I do before I paint and before, absolutely before I clear coat, is I'll go over it with a, a wax and grease remover. Um, I got, it's an automotive grade, I can't remember the brand, but I got it at AutoZone. It's just an automotive uh, wax and grease remover a little bit on my rag and wipe it off and, and it works great. So that's another way to, especially before I clear, I absolutely go over it with that. Go ahead. You know, do, when you guys use the dish soap, do you use just any dish soap? I mean, I know, I often, I've been for the last 25 years mm -hmm. using Dawn. That's the what they were, that's what nobody always told me, yeah. use Dawn because it degreased. Yeah. So I which dish soap yeah. do you use? Go ahead. I do, I have no idea what's in that dispenser at my house. Whatever my wife puts in that, <laughs> so I squirt it, and it's something that it's looks the like stuff dish soap. Paraffin. <laughs> you should be doing. I should be paying attention, but I'm like, believe it or not. Question over there. Do you use Dawn detergent? That's what Barry said. Dawn. Yeah, a lot of guys say Dawn. That's probably the good thing you're gonna find yeah. anywhere. That's usually what we have at our house, so I'm when assuming I that. In the automotive field, that's what we used to use. Use Dawn. Yeah. So Mike said in the automotive field they use Dawn. Dawn's Something with around. lavender helps me relax. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Dawn's really good because it's, it really is a degreaser. I mean, it's a good, it's a good basic soap. But, like Vince said, I don't, I mean, if you have Dawn, great. If you don't, whatever. I mean, soap. It's such a small amount. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. literally one drop in my, my little square tub. That's really all you need. You don't need a lot of soap because you don't want a lot of soap residue on your paint. You know? or in your car that you didn't have to clean it off. Just a little tiny bit of soap works great. So yeah, I don't know. I would recommend Dawn, but I don't know that it really yeah, doesn't matter. It helps too, you use warm water. Warm water, <coughs> yeah. Warm water does help. Helps with decals too. Okay, perfect. Uh, of course, add your decals before your clear coat, if that's the look you want. Um, on my, on my Mustang, the Boss 302 in there, it's uh, the Grabber Blue one. Those decals are after clear coat because that's from what my research was telling me, that's what I was supposed to do. So I put the decals on after the clear coat. So decals, um, yeah, I think it was Vince and I or somebody we were talking about, decals are the bane of my existence. I, I have more problems with decals than anything in any builds I've ever done. But from the research I've done from the, the talk I've been hearing from a lot of people, decals tend to go on over clear surfaces better. So maybe you guys have experience with that. 
I'm seeing a lot of heads going up and down. Yes, decals do go on <coughs> better on a cleared surface. They don't silver. Yeah. They don't silver, right. Go ahead. Even the military modelers clear coat a part of a tank or an airplane, put the decal on, then flat it. Then it flat it again. Take out the Perfect, yeah, even the military modelers will do that. Yep. So decal, again, recommend decals go over a gloss surface. So this was before I learned that, right? <laughs> again, every build I do, I learn something and I apply it to my next build. So that way I'm progressing, I'm, I'm getting better every time I build something. I learn something, move on, make my next build better. So this is not always true. Now I know that. Um, so again, yeah. clear it out in a little bit of decal. Go ahead, Paul. I was going to say, I don't know, I've seen your decals on your car under clear and they look sensational. Like, because they worked. They worked, yeah. yeah. You, you haven't seen the ones that didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you've got the classic full models who didn't break. That's right. You haven't seen all of them. In some stripes, like the Camaro, they're gloss white. And you totally got rid of some of the haze unless you got real nice decals like cardio wrap or something. But so a lot of that. Some of them come out a little weird. I've, I've had some weird Swiss decals. I'm like, right. I shouldn't have put them on the car. I know. I, I have seriously considered that, not putting decals on because I fight with them so much. Um, lost my train of thought. It's, it's, getting, it's, like, it's getting them on, and it's also kind of the way they look because the way they manufacture them sometimes. This part's glossy, a little bit over here, not as glossy, yeah, it's right. right. And you're like... We could probably use a whole seminar on decals. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. yeah. I mean, again, this is just the basics, right? I mean, every topic that we're discussing could be its own all-day class, for sure. Absolutely. And decals, that's probably a month-long class, as far as I'm concerned. Those, those suckers just kill me. <laughs> you're not the only one. All right. And then add your decals on. Now, some of, I wanted to bring that up. Like, I've obviously added a little bit of um, touch-up paint for my Camaro emblems, things like that. I've played back and forth doing that before or after clear. I've done both. Um, I've actually started doing it under the clear because I'm not seeing that much of a difference. And it protects it because that's such a such a small, fine surface, any type of friction on that thing, and the paint will just come right off, depending on what paint you have. So, I've actually been detail painting first, and then clearing over those, just to give it a seal, so it stays on forever. Yep. Anything else? I would just, well, he's got that picture up, I think it was, I was just gonna touch base on foiling. So a lot of the guys, they ask me how I get my foil so straight. I cut my foil, on the sheet of foil with a ruler, I cut little tiny strips of foil and I apply them like pinstripe. The reason I do that is because I can go around those edges, like on the drip edge, around the windshield. I can apply it on right on the edge and I never have to take the blade to the car now. I learned that from a guy a long time ago. I can't even remember which one of my modeling buddies it was. But that's how I foil it. I never put foil all around and then cut it out around. It's easier to cut it in strips, then you can overlap where you want. I made one of the little diagrams on the third page in there. And that's how I do my foiling. I keep it all straight and nice, and then you don't have to run the risk of slipping with the blade and running over it. That happens so often. We're almost done. And all. in that case, how would you curve it around the window? If you cut a small strip, you can bend it right around the window. Or, yeah. On a tight curve, you can't. So sometimes I'll just have to cut the corner. But the drip edge, you cut a, a pinch type of foil, you could go right on that drip edge and just bend it right and it'll go right there, and then you're done. You don't have to take a blade and try to get it. You're never gonna get it as straight cutting it on the car than you would just applying it like a pinch type. So you yeah, use a Q-tip to burnish it. Exactly, a Q-tip or a, two, a blunt toothpick. And, yeah. Yeah. Those hard toothpicks, um, those hard Q-tips from Tamaya are amazing for that. They're so hard. Question. Um, yeah. Just thank you for this illustration. You're welcome. That breaks the mold because I, the, the whole sheet of 
of foil and then cutting it out. If you yeah. take it apart a car, yeah. they don't come that way. No. That tight curve that you're right. talking about, it's impossible to do. Yeah. Manufacturers don't do it either. Yeah. They it's take a small piece of Yeah, it's easier to put a little And, yeah. and then you're only cutting. Make it look yeah. like fat. You're applying the blade on the model yeah. probably 10% right. of the time. Yeah. Little dark wash. Yes, I usually like those little black wash and around. Issue the dark yep. shadow around each piece of trim. Correct. I take a yep. lot of up close pictures of cars, junkyards everywhere, just to say, what does this really you look like to my eyes? Yeah. You got to build shadows. what you see, right? You got to replicate shadows. what you see, even and if it's not 100% accurate. Sometimes your eye does tricks that can scale. Yeah, oh, Greg had it. Something. No, I just had something for you. Oh, question. Somebody else had a. Did you have a question? Or? Yeah, I remember. Correct. So, to make sure your area is smooth before you apply your foil, absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Um, because if you have any imperfections in your paint, any bumps, anything like that, that foil will highlight that like crazy. Yeah, it shows up worse with the foil. And we were talking about something else before, which Greg remembered. You've probably seen it too. You take pictures of your models now with your camera or your digital camera. If you take your pictures of your builds while you're doing something, and then you look at the picture, you will guaranteed see a flaw in that picture that you can't see when you're looking at the model. And then you go back to the model and you say, oh, be damned, yeah, that, that one little thing is crooked or that there's a little bit of paint missing on the grill. You can't see it when you're looking at it, but when you take a picture of it and look back at the picture, like, damn, you'll see that little flaw. I do that all the time now. Take a picture, then I look at it. Greg says he blows his up. What'd you say, like really big? If it looks good on a big screen, it's gonna look good. There you go, right there. <laughs> go blow it up. And take it at different angles, because you'll find yes. a place where the light reflects differently, yes. and you'll say there's paint missing there. There's another one right here. So when will judging be done with scanning an electron microscope? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you have to ask Mark that. He said, when's it gonna be done with an electron microscope? He's judging. <laughs> That's why GSL is that that in the next seminar. <laughs> judging considerations. Yeah, we're, we're shutting down GSL before that happens. Well, <laughs> we've got three years to develop the technology. <laughs> Go ahead, one more. Uh, any pros and cons to using the foil versus the chrome pens? The chrome what? Oh, the chrome, the chrome pens. pens. The chrome pens. pens. To me, those chrome pens are great if I'm gonna, you're gonna do the door lock button or you're gonna do a lug nut. Trying to keep that, I, I don't know, I, it doesn't Relating seem. The ink is it, yeah, it'll flow out and then you mess it up and now you got a bigger problem. It's easier. Foil is so fast and so forgiving. You just, and if you don't like it, you can peel it off and do it over again. That Molotov pen will it's not run forgiving. all over the place. Yeah. So I've done both. Um, my 68 Charger in there, the Hemi Orange one. If you look at the, the wheel wells, those are chrome pen. Those are not foil. Those are, that's Molotov chrome pen. Um, if you're going to do that, I would go with the larger tip, the four mil tip, because the smaller ones are so hard to control on a contoured surface. So I have done that with the larger tip, because you can kind of stick it on your corner and it'll actually follow the contour better. Um, but again, if you bump something, a little more ink comes out, you know, it just, it's just something else to fight with. But again, it's your build to try it. I've tried both. Um, sometimes I like the chrome pen because I can just line it on there and I'm done. Again, the foil, I fight with the foil almost as much as I fight with the decals. Um, so again, it's your build. Build how you want, try something new. And that's how, I, that's how the chrome pen, I thought, well, let me just try that and see how it works. <coughs> so you can use the chrome pen, it does work. Um, just be careful on how you do it. Okay, any other questions? I think we'll, go ahead. If, if no one asks that many questions, I want to throw one more tip out on bonding. Okay, but this is your last one. There'll be more. But um, you use the wood. One thing that, that seems to work really well for me, and it, it's a low buck thing. I, I don't care about money when it comes to this stuff, but this was a low buck I learned from someplace. To hold your parts for painting, use the screw that they're molded with. Take the sprues, cut them off so you got nice, long, straight pieces, and then shave them with an X-Acto blade until you get the taper or whatever you want because you can actually glue directly with liquid cement like plaster directly to the mounting pin of the part. 
and it will bond harder than anything. You can do whatever you want with it, paint it, do whatever. And the thing is, you can paint it, prime it, if you have problems with painting, attacking, and you don't know how sure, the, the, the sprue's already got the color combinations you're working with. You can find out by tapping, spraying a little bit on the sprue, does it attack, does it look right, does it do whatever. When you're done with all of that, you've got the part there with only a small attachment point, and you dip it off, and now the part that's open and raw is the part that glues in, and the rest of the part is untouched and painted with it. That's a good tip too, right? Yeah. This is great. So, good. so using your using your sprue attach points to use that as a as a glue yeah. point. Chad and I were worried that we weren't even going to be able to fill up that whole hour. No. Damn. No. <laughs> that's hour. Keep going, guys. It's great. So yeah. So that's just the, the finished card. Okay. So I think that'll wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. And, and I mean, we're ready to stay. You know, if you go on a question and answer after the fact for the video, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Thanks for coming, guys.